you guys, you guys can all hear me okay? I don't know if you see, those shoes are amazing. They're great. I'm Mark Wunsch. I, I'm from Guild. My Twitter is at Mark Wunsch, so send me a toot. Um, <laughs> the geologic time scale. So the geologic time scale is this system of measurement that relates strict stratigraphy, which is like the study of rock layers, to time. Uh, yeah. Disclaimer, I am not a geologist. I am not an earth scientist of any kind. I've learned everything about this particular subject uh, on Wikipedia. Uh, so I'm now somewhat of an expert. Uh, <laughs> this is a metaphor that I'll be using, and that metaphor will be stretched to its limits. Um, but like anybody who writes JavaScript professionally, I am not without a lot of hubris. So let's be <laughs> Uh, I really love this concept of deep time. So the Earth is over four and a half billion years old. That expanse of time is so impressive and impossible to comprehend. And modern web development is about, what, 10 years old, maybe? Um, but we suffer, I think, as an industry of real short-sightedness. And so this is the second Backbone Conference um, and I'm very excited to be here and, and honored to be here. Um, but really, we're just discussing this really small sliver of technology, just like this one tiny layer in, in the tiny moment in time. Um, and at this conference, you're going to hear a lot about uh, implementations, and you've heard a lot about uh, certain processes and patterns to follow, and you'll hear more about that tomorrow. But what I would like to do now is uh, invite us all to take a, a big step back and take a really top-down view of web technologies and what, what brought us to this place today. Uh, I work at Gilt. Uh, Gilt, if you don't know, is an e-commerce company. We, we sell shoes and stuff. We do flash sales. Uh, so what that means, starting at noon Eastern time usually, we sell a limited amount of inventory for luxury goods, fashion, uh, at a steep discount for a, a small period of time. And I'm going to use Gilt as a case study, uh, because I, I work there. But in my time there, we've also tried a lot of different approaches to building web <coughs> applications. So we have our website, which is, you know, I guess a traditional e-commerce experience or a traditional e-commerce technology stack. Uh, we have some experiments. This is uh, Gilt Live, which is live.gilt.com, which uses real-time uh, web sockets to update what people are buying so you can see what people are buying right at that minute right at that second I should say and finally our mobile <coughs> web application which is like a single page app and, and all of these use backbones and backbone that singular in various capacities um, so guilt is at scale and what you would say is at organizational scale so there's about 60 engineers contributing to, to this experience. Um, and what I hope to answer today is what influenced us at Gilt to turn to specific technologies, one of them being Backbone. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about stratigraphy, so studying the layers of the Gilt tech stack. Um, I'm going to talk about this technology, it's called asynchronous JavaScript and XML. Maybe, maybe you guys have heard of that one. So uh, we'll then talk about that in the context of a particularly tough problem, which is the problem of pagination. I'm going to talk about robots and code that we write for robots. Uh, I'm going to talk about templates and how we use templates to keep the balance between robots and humans in check. Um, I'll discuss a very serious and important architecture, a uh, very serious business called models, views, and whatever. And finally, I'll close by attempting to predict the future. As I said before, hubris. Uh, stratigraphy. So I'm going to start by talking about the strata of our web application. And in a business like Gilt, these layers of technology form sort of one on top of the other. And by examining a cross-section of that system, we can infer a lot about the past several years of modern web development. What's interesting about stratigraphy is that it's bounded by a set of laws or principles. So the first one is the principle of superposition. 
Uh, and this one is simple. What's at the bottom is older than the things that are at the top. It's pretty simple. Um, and you, you can see what's at the bottom of your web application. You just do a git log reverse. And in this case, it actually doesn't help very much. Import from subversion. <laughs> so, so I guess this is like pre-Cambrian era or something. Um, this is in 2008, but I guess that's old enough to call legacy now. The principle of original horizontality this states that layers will tend to deposit horizontally. So Gilt, like many businesses, started as a Ruby on Rails application. Yeah. And with Rails uh, back then, you got uh, this thing called Prototype. I want to take some time to give lots of respect to Prototype.js. Yeah. In many ways, so ahead of its time. And it, it's so impressive. And it doesn't get the love it deserves. And it, doesn't, it didn't get the love it deserved back then, because uh, like most people, jQuery was becoming preferable. And so we went through this painful process, and I don't know how many of you went through this process of replacing prototype with jQuery. I see a hand back there, yeah. It was uh, painful. And what we've created here is what they call in geology an unconformity. So the layers are no longer continuous which brings us to the principle of lateral continuity. The technology layers continue to build up, and we continue to modify and chip away at certain areas and update others. And you, you get to something like that. <laughs> uh, so this was our system about two, two and a half years ago. And you can see that things are no longer deposited horizontally. So the principle of lateral continuity states that at some point these layers were continuous, but something happened, some technical erosion. So the deposit of this technical sediment continues until we reach where we are today. And you can see there's backbone in there. And I don't know, there's some coffee scripts in there, sure. Uh, I don't know what NPM is doing there, but OK. Um, and if you cut the top layer, if you're standing on the top soil, uh, it looks like a modern web stack. It's all on its way. <laughs> but <laughs> as you observe cross sections from different angles, you see a peak at something older, more hidden, something that's been buried. So in order to get a truly comprehensive understanding of the full front end guilt technology stack, this is just the front end, by the way, uh, you need to hold all of this in your head. And that's daunting. So you might call this technical debt. That's a nice term for it. Uh, but part of scaling a business and a technical organization is confronting the legacy of these layers hidden beneath the surface. So I want you to keep this layer cake in mind as I continue. And as we talk about scope and applications growing, often what we mean is we're adding layers to the system. And sometimes we induce technical erosion. So think about maintainability. It's a key word, maintainability. Now, here's a good question. Why do we need all of these technologies? Why, why didn't one work for us? What is so hard about the web that we introduce layer after layer of technology and complexity? It's Ajax. So Ajax is the fundamental piece of the modern web experience. Where would we be without asynchronous communication between the client and the server? Probably not here at this conference. But for something that's so core and so basic, we've really only recently begun to grasp the best way to do Ajax communication. I think that Ajax has a lot to do with the strata we saw earlier. And each one of those technology layers has an opinion about how to manage this client-server communication. So I made a point earlier to draw your attention to the original usage of the term Ajax. So it used to be that you used Ajax to do these naive uh, remote procedure calls with XML. Anybody remember those days? Show of hands. Yeah. Yeah, it wasn't great, but it worked. <laughs> Uh, there were HTTP calls that look and still look kind of like this. So get 
and we have a, a URL called add to cart, get add to cart. This is not item potent. Um, this is not restful. It's not ideal, but it works and worked. Does anybody remember RJS? Yeah, this was kind of crazy. So you make an Ajax request and you get back a dynamically generated JavaScript snippet and you still see this a bunch if it's not RJS. It's not great, but it, it worked. Uh, here's something you still see from time to time uh, and we still see it guilt. All of these examples are not, like th we think of these things as ancient history, but they're recent. So the server tells you this was successful but the con content of the response tells you it wasn't. Yeah, it's not ideal, but it works. And so all of this comes back to maintainability. And I'm going to touch on this point a few more times. All of these Ajax approaches, though maybe unappealing, are still Ajax. What makes us uneasy about those approaches is that we say they are unmaintainable. We question their maintainability. Um, and dealing with a large system means that you come across previous approaches where maintaining it feels <coughs> like a burden. And that's why you keep adding new layers. So <coughs> let's continue. So we did it. We, we're successful. We got a restful API that brings back a JSON response. And now wh what do we do with that? So it used to be, you know, when it was Ajax with an X with XML, uh, you would uh, you would just take that markup and append it to the DOM, and it worked okay. Um, now we have these client side templating languages. So when we're using JSON, you could either concatenate a bunch of strings together, or you apply that JSON object to a template. Um, and I just want to point out which is more complex. So on one hand, you take a bunch of DOM markup you get from the server and do inner HTML or something like that. On the other, you do some non-trivial <laughs> parsing of a templating file in a templating language and then apply a JSON document to that and then apply that to the DOM. And uh, I like client-side templating. I think it's awesome, right? There's no, no argument there but it's just we've introduced complexity. And it, if we want to pick a templating language, that's a new layer we have to think about. Um, so I just want to pose that question rhetorically, is that a win? And every piece of technology results in some kind of trade-off. Um, one last bit of technology I want to address in the world of Ajax is this little JavaScript call right here, which is awesome, but it's one more layer of complexity. And the important thing that I want to point out here uh, is the word state, as in the kind of mutable state you must maintain. And if each one of these pieces in our strata have different opinions about Ajax, there's something else to have an opinion on. Um, and history, the history API brings so many improvements to the Ajax user experience, it's unquestionable. Um, but I think it's a good transition to what I think is probably the most challenging user experience puzzle front end engineers have to work out. Right, get us a sip of water for this. <laughs> I think there is nothing more difficult than implementing your own infinite scrolling pagination mechanism. There are so many trade offs to consider. There is no one-size-fits-all solution. And just about every implementation, and I, I think, you, you know, just think about this for a second, every implementation has just one kind of bug or one kind of user experience quirk that makes it awful, right? <laughs> like, it, once you experience that bug, you're like, this is terrible. Flip table. <laughs> <laughs> so, so let's talk about this problem a little bit more in depth. So you start with pagination. This, this works pretty well, right? But there's too many pages. And I, there's too many pages. Like imagine like an infomercial. There's too many pages <laughs> that black and white do yeah. <laughs> So and your, your uh, user analytics shows that nobody is going pa past page two or three 
So you decide, okay, well, we need to try infinite scrolling. Um, and we've done this at Gilp. We made that same decision. And you end up with this huge queue of trade-offs and choices. How to load the pages in a memory efficient way. How to manage the page state so everything works. How to get the content from the server. Do you even attempt a custom solution? Or do you go with what Paul Irish did for you? It's a total mess. It's analysis paralysis. <coughs> so uh, read this blog post. The, I hope everyone's read it. It's really good at, at explaining the complexities of good infinite scrolling. Uh, but it requires this architectural consensus. And remember, we have layers that are really old. Um, it's not always possible to get that kind of consensus. And even after you've implemented infinite scrolling, it might not be the best thing for your users. Um, at Gilt, we've tried several different implementations of this pattern. We have lists of products. Uh, so I'm going to show you what the most recent one looked like. Look like this. <laughs> We're back to where we started. Uh, yeah, we found that a better experience is to try to get the user to see less of the thing we paginate through. So you use tools like filtering, use tools like search. That's a better user experience. And I'm going to come back to this. But it's important to understand how the choices in UX and user experience affect the technology stack. So how do those choices affect maintainability? Another thing that we have to factor into our technical decisions at Gilt is we have to think about robots, robots that spider the site. So Gilt gets a not insignificant portion of its revenue thanks to search engine optimization. So Google, Facebook, we have to make sure that our data is available to them. Um, a <coughs> colleague of mine suggested that what we ought to do is build one version of the website for robots and another version for humans, um, which isn't a bad idea, but it goes back to that question of maintainability. So this is what it looks like when I browse guilt.com in links. If you know what it's like to be, if you want to know what it's like to be a robot, try using links. So you can get insight into your how, how your pages work. Um, making our site work for robots is a requirement for our business. Therefore, serving HTML for, from the server is a requirement. But what about single page app experiences? Right? Users love this stuff. <laughs> if SEO is a priority, can we do this without sacrificing too much maintainability? I recognize that this is a client-side <laughs> application conference. And it seems strange to talk at length about server-side rendering. But enabling SEO and web spiders is something that the web is really good at. And it'd be a shame to lose out on that. Um, and I think we can strike a balance uh, between the robots and the humans. Um, but it takes technology applied at the right level. So I want to talk about templates now. I think there's a lot that can be done in the templating layer of an application stack that allows us to get the benefits of a rich client-driven application without hamstringing the server side. So there was this thought when Node.js came to prominence that if you write a server in the same programming language as the client, you, you get this sort of boost in efficiency and, and maintainability. Um, I think the dust has settled, and I, I don't think that's correct. Um, so I disagree with that. But if you think about a web app framework, either client or server side, so much logic gets uh, buried in the templating language. So here's an example. This is JSP. Nobody likes JSP. <laughs> Nobody. It's nearly impossible to reason about what's happening in the server side of a traditional web framework without diving into the templating layer. And when it's JSP, you want to avoid that <laughs> as much as possible. Um, so this is guilt JSP. I don't even want to begin. It's like quicksand. And then on the client side, we have something different. 
And at Gilt, we use handlebars.js. And handlebars is awesome, right? But as long as we have this mismatch between our client-side templating layer and our server-side templating layer, which is an unconformity, there's very little sharing we can do between those two layers. So at Gilt, our preferred web stack is Scala and the Play framework, which we're big fans of. So I wrote a handlebars implementation in Scala. We call it uh, Scandlebars internally. <laughs> it's open source, um, and we use it in production for more and more things. Our navigation is rendered with Scandlebars. More and more of our products are rendered with Scandlebars. And the reason I chose to do this is so that we can decide, we can make a decision when appropriate, whether or not to render something on the server side or the client side. So we can use one template to render on the server side for robots or for users who hit a URL for the first time. Or we can serialize those same Scala models into JSON and send them down into the client, where the same template <coughs> renders them client side. So we can leverage the same templates everywhere and choose to make rich single page user experiences where appropriate. Our templating layer now acts as one continuous uniform layer instead of being broken up into different stratum. So it's not foolproof. It's a Scala implementation of a JavaScript code base, um, but it works pretty good. Let's talk about Backbone. Backbone is great because, as we've heard, it helps you reason about the concerns of your application. This is a tweet I wrote. I'm quite proud of this tweet. If you can't read it, MVC stands for Model View Computers. So it, the truth is it doesn't matter what the letters mean or anything like that. Arguing about the M's and the V's in your architecture doesn't really do anything of value. Who cares? So at its worst, Backbone provides too little opinions about how your code should be structured. But at its best, it can act as this tunnel. It connects these packed layers of technology. And Backbone provides us a mechanism to mine our legacy technology stack. Because it's not so opinionated as to require a tectonic shift in our architecture on the server side. So let's go back to this pagination example. So we'll now use scandal bars and Backbone. When the user hovers over the next action, we make an AJAX request back to the server to get the next page. We expect JSON back from the server. We have the same templates on the client side as we do on the server side. So those templates come, are rendered based on this JSON, and they're stored in memory as a backbone view in this case. And then when the user does click, when the mouse down action occurs, the newly rendered page is already in memory, you know, from the whatever many milliseconds of hover state, um, and then we just replace the DOM. Um, and in this way, our application can either render server side or client side. So, if you're rendering on the server side and you have a bookmark to page two, you'll get page two really fast because it's rendered from the server. If you click the next page, you're going to get that rich, fast, single page-like experience. That's how we use those two things together. So what we ask of Backbone is this. Right? This is what we expect from any JavaScript application framework, I think. Can it give structure to web apps? And that's the point. It gives you a Backbone to work with. Can it bring some sanity to the complex client-server calls? Can it effectively manage page state? <coughs> By page state, I mean URLs. Can it map URLs to state? Can it provide rich experiences without sacrificing search engine optimization? Does it have a footprint that's small enough for mobile? I didn't talk a lot about mobile, but it's important. Um, and does it make my life easier? Arguably the most important thing. And I think the answer is yes, but it takes work. It takes effort. Unlike some more opinionated solutions, like maybe Angular or Ember, Backbone is viscous. It's like lava. 
It conforms to the shape of its surroundings. So you can get all of these things, but it might take more effort. So remember how I keep harping about maintainability? Yeah, I've talked a lot about maintainability and how layers of technology are added to ease maintainability. But maintainability offers no intrinsic value to users or to your business. The relative maintainability of the code is of no interest to them. Maintainability can only provide velocity, which allows you, the programmer, to deliver value at a greater rate. Flexibility on the code of the uh, on the of the code on the other hand is related directly to the programmer's ability to provide value ad hoc as needed. I think Backbone might sacrifice relative maintainability for flexibility. I like that trade-off. So those things designed for maintainability, large frameworks, often end up buried under those things that pro prove flexibility. So if you think about the civilization, civilizations of code that guilt has buried, you have Rails, you have Prototype, you have Java. Flexibility wins. <coughs> so given a constellation of technical choices, Backbone was the best choice given at that precise moment in time. But the right path is not always clear or easy. And sometimes you have to go through hell to find it. <laughs> so at Guild, um, some colleagues of mine have created their own JavaScript MVC framework. It's a contentious decision. Um, and we're watching that play out. Um, Technical erosion will take its course. Okay. Um, there's also a big push to use Angular or Ember or something more rich. We have to battle to prove that flexibility wins. And hopefully I've done that. I'm not informed enough about Angular to really weigh in, but I hope that we continue to choose the path of flexibility in our front end technology. All right, that's kind of dark, last couple things. Let's talk about the future. <laughs> so, having observed the strata of Gilt's front end stack, I'm going to try to predict where I think we will see more movement, more shifts in our geological foundation. A reminder that uh, modernity, what you're standing on now, is the top layer, and there's layers beneath you. So where will we be? I think more tools like Marionette or Chaplin will become more prominent, and we'll see more like them. Um, the back plugs, that was new to me, uh, really impressive. So Backbone is so lightweight. Um, it's a kernel. Right? It's a kernel for modern web development. And because of that, I actually think we'll see more robust frameworks written on top of it. Um, I think Brian talked a little bit about this earlier. Dependency management and build tools will become a standard tool in everybody's library. Uh, I think Sam alluded to this. Modules and components are the future. So at Gilt, we built this build system for front end packages before Bower emerged. And Bower is really appealing. Um, there's this thing called web jars that are emerging out of the JVM that look really interesting as well. There's so much more room here to grow, and as applications increase in scope, we'll have to figure out how to isolate front-end dependency graphs. It's a very hard problem. Is the DOM good enough? <laughs> so I was talking about this with you guys earlier. It's Dom DeLuise. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Dom DeLuise, everyone. <laughs> a, <laughs> so th there's this idea that there's this cohort of JavaScript developers who know nothing beyond jQuery. And I think jQuery is waning in its relevancy. I think the DOM has improved, 
as uh, browsers get more modern and influence the, the standardization process more. And I think the DOM can be really powerful. Mobile, duh. Um, but I think we're going to have to face some uncomfortable truths regarding mobile performance. Um, I don't know if you've read this blog post, uh, why mobile web apps are slow, it's, it's really good. Uh, everybody ought to read it. Um, mobile and desktop web will converge, and we're seeing that already at Gelt. I'm on the mobile team at Gelt uh, pretty recently. So uh, one last prognostication, somewhat <coughs> controversial. There's a reasoned argument to be made that static typing works better in larger organizations. So with a dynamically typed, or, uh, type, dynamically typed language, you have to depend on test coverage to make sure your app works. Test coverage is so important um, because it enables continuous integration, which enables continuous delivery, which means you can press a button, your application is on the internet, um, distributed to millions of people. Um, but tests uh, can fail. Right? Tests require, in order to get to that level, the continuous delivery level, you have to have a really good testing infrastructure. Um, and that means people have to write tests, which means you have to enforce really good test writing practices. And even then, they can fail. Um, a statically typed language enforces API contracts. It's like free tests. Uh, so TypeScript is a language coming out of Microsoft that's a typed superset of JavaScript. Uh, it looks really interesting, and at Gilt, we're keeping a close eye on it. I should mention I sell some t-shirts. <laughs> this is a Backbone and Angular and Ember shirt, Gang of Four t-shirt. These shirts are great for summer wear. <laughs> we'll transition well into the fall season. <laughs> Once again, my name is Mark Wunsch. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs> so I ended early, uh, but I have plenty of time for questions. Hi. Hi. Uh, have you solved the problem of uh, duplication of URLs with the backbone router and then um, URLs, um, how you're parsing out on your server side of uh, the shared uh, regex. Um, also, have you did you guys evaluate uh, Mustache as a templating language before you chose to go with handlebars? Sure, I'll answer the second question first, which is did we evaluate Mustache before choosing handlebars? And the answer is yes. Uh, mustache is arguably more language agnostic, and that's because it's stricter it's, it's a very strict, logicless language. Um, and the downside to mustache uh, for, for many engineers is that it's so strict. It is logicless. Uh, so it's like a double-edged sword. Um, and there was just, we couldn't keep people from using handlebars on the client side. There are Scala implementations of mustache, but the handlebar, handlebars can provide um, that, com that the sort of logic you need without being a burden. But there are parts of handlebars that are like a true foot cannon, so. Um, uh, yes, we did. Uh, the other question was related to sort of the uh, complexity of duplication of routes between a backbone router and a server side router. So uh, we have solved that because we do not use <laughs> backbone router. Um, so one of the things that uh, Play provides uh, is uh, a Java Play framework, which is the, the framework we prefer, provides sort of a JavaScript API to get information about routes. So we just use that API. And that tells us how to get what we need. Uh, in practice, it's, it's, it's not so hard. We, we, don't do, we don't do enough complex state interactions that require a new URL. A, state, a, a new URL basically means that state has changed. Um, and we don't do enough of those state transitions to really warrant uh, something like backbone.router. Yeah, hi. 
over how long did it take um, Guild's tech stack to evolve from the beginning, as you said, to now, and were there any major, you know, forks in the road that you might have done differently? That's an amazing question. So the answer is, is uh, Guild was founded in 2007. So that's, what, six years? That's nothing, it's like a blink in the eye. In that time, we've changed our primary programming language three times. So is there something we would have done differently? Yeah, maybe. Maybe we would have started with the JVM earlier. Um, there was a really contentious decision so just before I joined. I've been at Guild for three years. Uh, there was a contentious decision when we moved from Ruby to, to JRuby and then to Java. Um, we moved to, you know, hopefully Java without all the crop, but that's hard to get. Um, that was very contentious, moving from that point. Um, I think that's the biggest shift, um, but yeah, guilt has like has has like a, has is like a microcosm of like a twenty-year technology company. Like, um, but it's been I think a good thing because we've been able to move quickly, and yeah, we have these layers, which, which you know are technical debt, but um, there's something I think we're getting rid of a lot of that debt, and there are some things that are okay to just be maintained doesn't hurt anybody. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Hi. Over there. Do you use handlebar helpers? And if so, how do you manage the logic on that on the server side and on the client side? OK, great question. Uh, handlebar helpers, an effective foot cannon for handlebars. <laughs> so what's, 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 what will make you just blow your foot off with handlebars helpers is that they're, they can sort of act, one, they're tied to a global scope. They're bound to the handlebars object in JavaScript, which is it's less than ideal. Um, and they, they can manipulate all kinds of things. So I, I try to stress to avoid them um, and only use them when absolutely needed. Um, and there are cases when they are needed. Um, and in that case, yeah, uh, Scandlebars does support helpers. <laughs> Obviously, you you do not. Uh, it's not the same language. You have to implement them in two different things. And Scandlebars, because it's a different programming language in a different environment, has constraints on what a helper can or can't do. But a good helper should fit into those constraints. Um, I'm working on a sort of rewrite to the parser and into some of those parts to make it a little bit more palatable, because the transition from JavaScript to Scala is not the easiest one to make, and I'd like to make that a little bit easier. But Scala is a functional language, and so uh, can can have helpers. <coughs> so, yeah, we write helpers for both the client side and server side, and the duplicated. Anybody else? Oh, hi. So you were There's a microphone on its way. So you were saying that TypeScript is kind of a stand-in for testing somewhat. Um, does, does that mean, is it a replacement, are you using it as a replacement for testing? No, no. So TypeScript is a statically typed language. It uses a compiler. And that compiler checks types. So you have to declare, this, is, this returns a string. And the compiler will say, you tried to do something where that wasn't the case. You're wrong. But, it's, but a, any statically typed language be it TypeScript or Java or Scala is, n is not, the compiler is not sufficient alone to replace tests. The compiler just writes tests that you don't think about and enforces APIs. So rather than making something that might not be, writing code that might not be tested, the compiler will say, by the way, you violated this contract that this API was saying. Um, so that's all it is. I think that's just the benefit of static typing in general. Okay. Could you uh, talk a little bit about the performance of handlebars on mobile? Um, not really. <laughs> uh, to be honest, I have, it's not something I've really dug in deep about. Um, is there anything, is something specific that you found in? No, uh, but just we've been 
more report on the experience of using JavaScript and a lot of JavaScript on the on mobile so here what your experience was. Yeah, I, I I I don't have anything per like per se. I don't know the memory footprint or the CPU um, <coughs> like um, effect that handlebars has. I've never really profiled handlebars, um, but in general, um, yeah, I uh, I'm with Nicholas Sakas. Like I, I think I don't know if I pronounced his name right, but I think less JavaScript can be better, um, and the templating layer. Is, is probably a really good layer to push <coughs> a lot of this complexity. Um, yeah, uh, I can't answer your question, unfortunately. But now you've got me very curious, so <coughs> we'll see. Yeah? OK, the question was, uh, how do you evaluate how much logic to put into handlebars, and uh, when is when is too much too much? Um, so the answer is I, I try to constrain it so that I put as little logic into handlebars as possible. And the way we try to do this is in the Scala, in the server side, we have these view models basically. Right? What what do we need to render a template? What, what do we need just to render that template? And hopefully the view model encapsulates most of the logic. Um, and then the, we have sort of another API in Backbone, in a Backbone view, that sort of replicates the methods, but can be basically hydrated from a serialized view model from the server. Um, so the answer is we try to limit the amount of logic as much as possible. Now. That's not always easy because people just want to take whatever objects they have and put them, put them where they need to go. Um, and in that case, they'll hit the pain for anybody. Like you, you know when it's painful because all of a sudden you're calling all of these weird methods on an object, um, and you're violating, I believe, the law of Demeter, De Demeter, the one that says don't, don't talk to your friends, but you can talk to your that one. You're violating that. <laughs> yeah, you can't talk to your friends, friends. It's a social contract. But you know it, right? because it begins to get painful, and any refactoring of that model breaks 